Again, thank you very much, Anshul, for the nice uh, introduction. And I would also like to thank uh, Olympus for the invitation and for giving me the possibility to share our experiences with uh, 4K and a little bit of robotics um, in orbital surgery. I'm located at the University Hospital in Essen, and uh, we have a good cooperation uh, with the ophthalmologists and neurosurgeons and uh, are um, having um, a larger orbital center located at the university, and we have a larger robotic program, mainly focusing on transoral robotic surgery, but also uh, having the skull base um, in focus. But I would like to start with 4K, and the first question is, what, is it, what does it technically mean? And it means we have a resolution of uh, 3840p, and this means you get four times more information out of your picture. And this could be already the end of the presentation because this is the most relevant part for us as surgeons. Uh, we, are, uh, we have to rely on what we see on our monitors and if we get four times uh, uh, as much of information out of this uh, um, uh, screen, then it's obvious that it will help us to perform surgeries especially in situations where you would like to zoom in into certain uh, anatomic regions, especially to clarify whether we can identify smaller ner nerves or vessels. Um, for, care, for care helps you because it remains crystal clear. You have a high resolution, um, sharp edges, and uh, this is in comparison to HD totally different. I will later on show some clinical examples what it means. It's not only resolution, but also a matter of color, because in comparison to microscopes, the endoscopic view is more away from the normal um, human eye view uh, than the microscope it is. Now with 4K, we have um, a higher variety of colors, which is not very necessary in the green spectrum, but if we are looking at the red colors, it's now um, closer to the normal view and closer to what we see with our normal eyes. And that also helps because we are very familiar uh, with, these, with these colors. In combination with special lenses who um, support this technology and in combination with um, possibilities of autofocus and uh, electronic zoom, it reduces the movements of the endoscopes, uh, especially if you go uh, towards skull base, because more often you can use the autofocus function and keep your instruments sharp in your autofocus and in your surgical field. We combined the 4K technology, which we are using uh, since last autumn, so more than half a year now, uh, with a robotic arm because we are in general interested in using robotic platforms, not because we want uh, help, but we would like to see whether there are opportunities uh, where we get support in our surgical situation. So far, there is no surgical robot who is able uh, to approach skull base properly, especially using the proper instrumentation. Also, there is a size issue. But what is available is um, a robotic arm which can uh, hold endoscopes and um, therefore maybe add a third or fifth hand uh, in our uh, surgical procedures. This robot is um, directed by a foot pedal, and here we see the situation with a mounted endoscope. This is the robotic arm. It's flat, it's out of uh, the vision, and using the huge monitor, monitors of 4K endoscopy um, is a good combination in this situation. And again, it's not, it's not only resolution and color, but it's also uh, a matter of size, because uh, we are now able to use a 55 
inch monitor during surgery uh, because 4K still keeps, the high, keeps up the high resolution. Another um, uh, fact is that the distance from the surgeon to the monitor is and can be much shorter than using an HD monitor. And if you get close to an HD monitor, what happens is that you see more pixels, the picture is no longer sharp, and it doesn't help. There are many situations where you would like to see more and try to go closer to your screen, and in the end it's frustrating because you don't get more information. That's different in 4K. As soon as you really would like to be close to the situation, you can zoom in, but anyway, uh, your position during surgery is much closer uh, to the screen. Here we see such a situation. The distance is around 1.5 meters. Um, in combination with this large screen, it makes you feel being inside this surgery. And in the end, it's much more comfortable for the, comfortable for the surgeon because you do not have to concentrate uh, so much uh, to identify details. Uh, in this surgery. The endoscopic orbital approach is well known, which means usually you go transnasally to uh, the orbit. It's also possible to use lateral uh, approaches and also endoscopic lateral approaches via different um, incisions. Uh, I will demonstrate what we have practiced and in the end, in the last years, especially in Italy, um, it was shown that there are also transorbital um, procedures which allow you to reach uh, the medial or anterior cranial fossa, for example, in um, meningioma um, surgery. And if as soon as you want to go into the orbit, things become a little bit more complicated because there is no longer any cavity you are approaching, but it's solid tissue, fat tissue, which uh, at once starts to move um, if you remove the periorbit. And we have to use the gaps between the muscles to enter the orbit. But on the other hand, both lateral and medial approaches allow us to approach the orbital apex, uh, which is located deep in the skull, and especially the endoscopic approaches help a lot. Most commonly, endoscopic surgery is uh, used in patients with Graves' orbitopathy, and especially in those patients, the low morbidity of endoscopic surgery led to um, further indications in the beginning, two decades ago, uh, the compression surgery was only performed in patients with optic nerve compression if the uh, site was in danger. Nowadays, also cosmetic reasons can be a reason for surgical procedures. We started six years ago and uh, because we have located a huge orbital center, we were able to um, perform 948 um, balanced, mostly balanced endoscopic orbital uh, decompressions. And I would like to show you now the difference between HD and um, 4K. This is a HD uh, video of the removal of uh, the medial orbital wall. Here we see the periorbit, which is incised close to the skull base, and uh, later on we see fat tissue prolaving. And this is um, after resecting the medial wall, we achieve a decompression. Here's the, this is a fat prolapse into the uh, etmoid sinus. We still have control of the sphenoid sinus and we still have control of the uh, frontal sinus, which is a great difference uh, in comparison to an external approach. Now we would like to see the 4K video. Uh, it's already running. And what you see, the difference is a much, um, uh, this is a uh, wrong video, but here we see uh, uh, the admirate artery, if you 
look close behind the open sphenoid, and now it's right, uh, we incise and resect the periorbit. The colors are different, and you have different possibilities uh, to choose a color mode which comes close to what you are maybe used to. Uh, in the end, all the red colors are more normal than using uh, full HD technique. Again, resection of the periorbit and fat prolapse and adequate uh, decompression. Again, control of the frontal sinus and of the sphenoid in order to avoid, uh, avoid mucoceles, which is very important. Um, next video. This is uh, from the from a left eye. See the lamina papyracea still intact. Uh, above you see the anterior etmoid, ar etmoid artery, and 4K allows you really to watch the pulsation um, and the blood flow inside this vessel, with, which is um, obviously an advantage in identifying such vessels and nerves. Again, here we see the high resolution. Uh, you can clearly identify the skull base or relevant um, anatomical structures. And here we see a setting using um, the robotic arm. And if you only enter one nostril, which is uh, very common in orbital surgery, because we not uh, necessarily want to remove posterior parts of the septum in this surgery in order to avoid morbidity, then it becomes very crowded in this nostril. And um, a robotic arm could be helpful in placing the endoscope above your instruments. Um, then there is no need for further assistance and you can perform a three-hands surgery. In addition, in uh, surgeries of the skull base with a two-nostril approach, um, the robot could help you in uh, performing five, up to five-hands surgeries, uh, which could be an advantage. The number of cases is not high enough to finally judge about it. This is our incision for the lateral um, approach, it's uh, less than one centimeter incision uh, in the wrinkled lines. Usually we perform these surgeries in uh, adults, so you have some wrinkled lines to hide your incision. On the other hand, you can move it over the bone and get a perfect uh, exposition of the lateral wall. We, in many cases, we temporarily uh, remove parts of the wall in order to get a good access to the deep lateral wall, which is decisive for your results uh, in orbital decompression. And here we see an HD um, video of uh, drilling out the deep lateral wall down to the skull base. Five millimeters further, you would enter the uh, medial and anterior cranial fossa. Also on the lateral part, we uh, incise and resect uh, the periorbit in order to allow the fat to prolapse. And in comparison, we have here a 4K resolution. And what you clearly see is, again, the colors have changed, but the resolution gives you more information about the sponge bone. It would be easier to identify the dura and if you go further on, uh, also the uh, resolution of nerves and other anatomical structures are superior. Um, and this is uh, a video using uh, a five hands technique on the lateral approach. So we are uh, putting in an endoscope and uh, using a robotic arm um, gives you further assistance. So there is no need for, mu for much movement and both assistant and nurse have good access uh, to the monitor and can follow uh, your surgical procedure. This is the resection of uh, the fat tissue from the lateral part during uh, decompression. 
Our concept is that we do graded decompression, which means um, it's important to do as much compression as needed in uh, different aspects. The first is that we would like to have an adequate reduction of proptosis, especially if we have asymmetric cases, it's necessary to get a symmetric uh, solution in the end. And in those cases where we have a huge amount of proptosis, we would like to have an extended uh, decompression, meaning removing every bone uh, up to the frontal recess. Also, the interior part of the medial wall reaching to the lacrimal bone can be removed. This course causes very often more diplopia post-operatively. Uh, but on the other hand, um, if you want to uh, achieve an adequate uh, reduction of proptosis, it's necessary. And also, the medial uh, inferior part um, can and has to be resected in uh, many cases, which could lead to, uh, again, um, a dislocation of the, of the bulb. But in man, uh, many cases, uh, this is um, necessary. Here in a different plane, we see smaller resections do not cause many, uh, uh, so much diplopia, but also the amount of reduction of proptosis is uh, less. And as soon as you remove more bone, combine it as a balanced uh, decompression, maybe even do not uh, replant uh, the orbital rim, um, helps you to uh, reduce uh, the amount of proptosis. At the lateral part, it's relatively um, easy and uh, not too dangerous to remove uh, a certain amount of fat tissue up to three, uh, three milliliters uh, is possible, which helps uh, for decompression, and this could be um, a maximum decompression with removing almost uh, all of the bony uh, borders of the orbit um, in cases where it's necessary. So half of our cases, many uh, patients come from abroad, um, have uh, been examined by a follow-up. I will just give you a short glimpse of our results. But you see there is an average reduction of proptosis of 5.1 millimeter, uh, which is pretty high, but shows that uh, many patients have a severe disease. And um, another important point is that in those cases when you really have to decompress uh, a lot, uh, looking at patients with an initial hurdle index of uh, maybe 36 and more, then we are able to do so um, with a reduction of maybe 1.4 centimeters. And in those cases where maybe just an optical, uh, optic nerve compression is relevant and you do not need to uh, reduce the proptosis uh, too much, you can just decompress the uh, orbital apex and um, are successful with this. Just a short two, uh, one or two examples for orbital tumors. Um, again, there is uh, a little bit of difficulty due to the uh, solid tissue and the prolapse of the soft tissue during surgery. But uh, on the other hand, is, uh, in many cases, diagnosis is important. You need to uh, perform uh, incisional biopsies in order to differentiate between inflammation and lymphoma. And um, endoscopic approaches are uh, a perfect uh, for these patients uh, with low mobility. Also, re uh, sections of tumor, hemangioma, and others are possible. And uh, so far, we have done, um, until now, more than 50 of those cases. And I will show you some examples. Again, an HD video of the orbital apex. Uh, we see the carotid artery very prominent in the sphenoid. Um, it is always helpful to expose and open up the sphenoid um, and to control it in order to avoid uh, mucoceles and to get a better orientation concerning anatomy. And in those cases, uh, you will have to use those gaps. We already see the inflammated tissue between the muscles in the apex, and um, then you will be able to um, resect uh, tissue in the relevant area.
And looking at this with 4K, this is a left eye uh, with a complete inflammated um, orbital apex, a huge proptosis in this patient. And we see inflammated uh, tissue. In fact, that was a lymphoma. It doesn't appear to be uh, in, the, um, in the video. Um, and what you see is uh, the color of the fat tissue is as yellow as you are expecting it to be. You could also nowadays use such uh, endoscopes as a macro camera. For example, in um, uh, lacrimal duct uh, surgery. And here we see uh, a macro picture. Um, so it's easy to switch from an endoscopic to a macroscopic view for uh, bougie dilating and uh, insertion um, of a silicone uh, drain in this area. So to conclude, due to this low mobility, as Angel already said, also in orbital surgery we see a paradigm change uh, because uh, ENT surgeons are more often consulted uh, for biopsies, for resections of tumors, and especially in orbital decompression, we have uh, good te techniques. And one reason is uh, the better visualization uh, using the 4K, for example. Again, a milestone in comparison to uh, full HD, higher resolution, larger images, better true colors, and at the end, if you have a longer surgery, it could take some hours. It's much more comfortable for you as a surgeon because you do not have to concentrate so much on the details. It's, you're more used to it to have a clear and high defined uh, visualization. In combination with robots and other digital platforms, um, there is not enough time to mention everything about it, but in combination with augmented reality, virtual reality, 3D planning, pre- and post-operatively, intraoperative um, imaging, the indications for endoscopic uh, skull base and orbital surgery will be further promoted. And in this situation, it's very important to have an interdisciplinary strategy because it's very important to have colleagues on board, both from neurosurgery and ophthalmology, um, because they also have to follow this path uh, in order to be able to do surgeries uh, together in future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.